Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, and welcome to The Long Read from Stuff. This week's story is called The Fanga Sisters by Dominion Post reporter Ethan Te Ora. Now, The Long Read is inching its way out of lockdown. I am out of the duvet fort. Ethan in Wellington can't read his story for us this week, but he can join me now by phone. Hi, Ethan. Kia ora, Michael. So, The Fanga Sisters, this set the scene for us. Uh, what is your story about? So the the story is about uh, three sisters, the Fanga sisters, um, from you know one Fano, Francis, Charmaine, and May. Um, each of these women is is in their sixties, and in recent years has has dealt with um, housing instability and um, periods of homelessness. And each of them has found um, found found housing and and. Um, security in, in each other, but also uh, through the local marae in Stokes Valley. The story also traces the history of Māori housing, mostly since the urban migration at the middle of last century till present day, but also considers, you know, the effects of colonisation before on on that trajectory and and considers um, what, the, what the way forward might be. That's a, a broad canvas you're working with there, Māori housing, over, over that period, how did you settle on the story and the Whanga sisters as the main characters? Well, originally it was a, a much narrower, smaller canvas. I was um, looking to do a story about Komatua housing and, you know, sort of looking for, looking at rather, um, housing solutions for older Māori. And I'd, I'd reached out to um, several marae around the Wellington region um, and uh, several people I knew um, and had, had spoken to Henrietta Gemmel at Koranui Marae. Um, she introduced me to Charmaine, who works at Koranui as a, um, as a social worker. I mean, I guess the scope got bigger from there. She introduced me to um, Francis and May and the three of us sat down and sort of, um, you know, talked about their recent history, um, particularly Francis, and how she had recently moved in to emergency housing, and speaking to them and, and about their lives and how the family had moved from um, the country to Stokes Valley in the early 60s. It shaped for me as, as a, a story with real present-day stakes, but also you know, a way to look at the last 60 years as, you know, encapsulated by this, by these three sisters, but, you know, exploring the effects of urban migration more generally. Thanks, Ethan. Now, here is me reading a slightly condensed version of Ethan's story, The Fanga Sisters. The bride didn't have cold feet. She had bare shoulders. Forty minutes after the wedding was due to start, Frances Fanga was still in her bedroom, fretting over the unfastened neck of her korowai. The cloak hung on her shoulders, a thick tussock of red feathers trailing down over her chest. Luckily, the wedding venue was the home she shared with her groom. The aisle began at the door of the master bedroom, continued down the hallway, through the kitchen, and into the lounge, where guests waited. 27 Russell Road, a three-bedroom house in the lower hut suburb of Wainuiamata, didn't look like much from the street. A drab olive exterior, with a border of lavender bushes behind a white picket fence. To Francis, though, those four walls were a haven. It was the place where she found stability in a job as a nurse, and security with her partner of almost 20 years. More than a stage for the mundane theatre of life, the house was a tangible mantle which held their memories together. In the backyard, beside the kōwhai tree, they buried the afterbirth and umbilical cord of their mokopuna. And at $380 a week, the house was also a steel. 
After seven years as renters at Russell Road, the landlord had suggested they buy the property from him. At 60, Frances had never owned a house. But with the man who was about to become her second husband, she dared to dream. At that moment, however, the whole house rattled with the force of an unconventional wire We Will Rock You by Queen. The song was chosen by the groom, Rangatira Tuhi, known to everyone as Ranga. He tapped a foot to its distinctive rhythm, stomp, stomp, clap. Under the influence of that beat, the bride's absence became like the tense pre-match moments at the rugby club, as if Fano in the lounge were waiting for the home side to take the field. Ranga wore a korawai too, with a pattern of koru that signified new beginnings. But hidden beneath the garment was a small infusion pump, driving morphine through a syringe into his veins. As the song repeated, one of the cousins pulled out a chair for him, and he sat down to save his strength. If those korawai, woven over months, were a labour of love, then the wedding arrangements, thrown together in days, were a triumph of aroha. Mei Fanga, the eldest of the three sisters, led the preparations, kai, decorations and flowers. She would support her baby sister in other ways, moving into the sleepout behind the house following Ranga's diagnosis of terminal lung cancer a few weeks earlier. Now 65 years old, she had always been the tuakana, or big sister, to her younger sisters, among ten siblings total. Frances sometimes still called her mummy. The last few weeks had passed for Frances as a horrifying gauntlet of hospital appointments, tests and arrangements. She took indefinite leave from work to care for Ranga. The morning of the wedding, she played a dual role, palliative nurse and protector. She administered morphine and other painkillers, negotiating the delicate chemical balance between comfort and lucidity, while at the same time keeping visiting relatives at bay to conserve Ranga's energy. Charmaine McLean Fanga, the middle sister, would care for Francis during that time too making plans for the tangihanga, which, by now, everyone accepted was coming. And even though she was out of town that day on marae business, she joined the wedding in spirit. At noon, when the ceremony was supposed to start, she picked up a taiaha where she was and enacted the cultural practice of whakawatia to acknowledge Francis and Ranga. At a quarter to one, the korawai was finally tied, and Francis's youngest son gave her away. As she walked down the hallway, her mokopuna threw rose petals at her feet, and her chosen waiata, somewhere over the rainbow, played over a speaker. Francis and Ranga were then married, in their own living room, surrounded by Fano. Three days later, Ranga would die, with Francis beside him, in the bedroom of their home. For months afterwards, Francis often found herself unable to leave that room, let alone return to work. Even though May stayed on to help cover rent, the dream of someday owning that house was replaced by the stress of everyday expenses. I was just scrimping with the rent, Francis says. I was trying to hold on to the house because of the memories. I knew it was time for me to let go. At six years old, Francis Fanger was plucked from the countryside and taken to the city 
It was a trip to get ice cream, which created the necessary diversion. She was a whāngai, or customary adoption, given to an older relative three years earlier, living at a rambling homestead in Mahia, overrun with mokopuna. She couldn't remember what her own mother looked like. I used to pray for her to come and get me, she says. As the ice cream melted down her wrist that day and the car sped down a country back road, Frances tried not to ruin her new dress. Its texture and colour remain vivid, even now. Red velvet with white lace. It was a gift from the stranger at the wheel of the car, who also bought the ice cream. Her own mother, Huapai Linda McLean, who was kidnapping her. My prayers were answered, Frances says. I felt like the happiest child in the whole wide world. Frances is unsure why an elaborate plot was required to claim her back. Her five other siblings at the time, the family would later grow to ten children, migrated with their parents in 1962 from the rural outskirts of Gisborne to Stokes Valley near Wellington, then in the midst of a large-scale urban development. Now a suburb on the edge of Lower Hutt, Stokes Valley is sometimes called Koronui, meaning big ferns, most likely a reference to lush bush which once carpeted the valley between Upper and Lower Hutt. Large sections of that bush were deforested in the 1960s, replaced by a grid of roads and houses built to support a growing population. By the time Francis arrived in 1965, the subdivision was taking shape. I was amazed by the roads, the footpaths, the house, she says. Back home, it's all paddocks. The transformation was a microcosm of the vast migrations that were then reshaping Aotearoa. In 50 years, Māori underwent one of the fastest rates of urbanisation ever seen in the world, from 83% rural in 1936 to 83% urban by 1986. As the 20th century began, New Zealand was, essentially, two separate countries. During early colonisation and war between tribes and colonial forces, different hapu and iwi had been pushed into rural areas, where they remain today. Western European migrants built their own towns off a range of fair and dubious land sales and received the bulk of national and local government services. Some hapu and iwi were able to set up cities and towns too, such as Te Atiawa at Waifetu in the Hutt Valley and Ngāti Toa in Porirua. At the time, though, Māori mostly lived in rural areas. From the late 1930s, that changed as Māori began to move to the cities following better employment prospects. Aroha Harris is an associate professor at the University of Auckland, specialising in Māori histories in the 20th century. She says Māori made tragic sacrifices in order to migrate, but were never pawns. They made careful decisions about whether or not to go, who would go and who would stay behind, Harris says. I've heard stories of whole families moving, three generations all going together. I've also interviewed people who, when they left, decided they were leaving forever. They were never, ever coming home. There wasn't anything to come back to in some cases. University of Canterbury Senior Research Fellow Matthew Rout co-authored Homeless and Landless in Two Generations, a paper which traces how factors such as land loss and intergenerational poverty mean almost no Māori will own houses by 2061, unless the current trajectory reverses. He says that villages and settlements, known as kāinga, acted, for a time, as a kind of protective envelope from colonisation. Migration to the cities, however, 
was effectively a transition from a subsistence lifestyle into low-wage work. Consider all the trade training schemes in the 1960s, Rout says. And if you go beyond that, the colonial discourse, which positioned Māori as subaltern, or blue-collar workers, basically. It's all the direct outcome of state policies, state intentions. Fiona Cram, who leads the Kopapa Māori research organisation Katoa Limited, says those imperatives were long-standing. Māori served this country, she says, not just in the war, but in all the big projects, in the dams, in the railways, in building infrastructure in this country, and were offered rental accommodation that aligned with their jobs. And they moved all over the place as a consequence, so people in their 50s and 60s who grew up with their whānau renting were often in rental accommodation because their parents moved for work all the time. Tehi Peke Fanga, the father of the three Fanga sisters and their seven brothers, was no stranger to this life. He was a roadman for the Ministry of Works, a class of worker upon whose labour the backbone of Aotearoa was built, its highways and roads. Once the family moved to Koranui, he would retrain as a foreman. Harris says the state aimed to extract Māori from their kainga as much as it aimed to attract them to the city. They didn't really want Māori to hold on to their land interests in the way we like to, she says. They didn't think that would be necessary in a modern world. Hi, I'm Carol Hirschfeld, the head of video and audio at Stuff. If you're enjoying our Long Reads podcast, how about contributing to the Stuff Supporter Programme? You can contribute any amount you choose, and you can do it just once, or monthly, or annually. Direct support from people like you helps us produce the kind of journalism you're listening to right now. Go to stuff.co.nz forward slash support. As darkness fell upon the leafy canopy, The Whānga children didn't know if they would find their way home. Throughout the neighbourhood, the children had become known as the ducklings for the orderly queue they formed wherever they went. May always walked at the head of the line. That day, the siblings wanted to show Frances her new backyard. They set out in the morning for the hills at the back of Stokes Valley. Hours later, they found themselves lost in dense bush. Don't worry, May told her younger siblings. We're going to be fine. We'll find our way. Today, those hills, known as the Horoeka Scenic Reserve, are maintained as walking tracks. Miniature doorways line the trail as entertainment for young trampers. That day, in the 1960s, The hills were an entrance into a world the sisters had left behind. Eventually, they followed a creek down the hill and found their way home again. May was 12 years old when the Fanga family boarded the train from Gisborne to Wellington. They moved to 5 Logie Street in Stokes Valley, a four-bedroom house newly built by the Department of Māori Affairs. In the evenings, Tehi Peke Whanga would often tell his children vivid stories about their Turanga Waiwai, the place they came from on the East Coast. He even devised a makeshift television out of a lunch wrap box as a visual aid. He would talk about it and I would be crying, May says. Every night I used to cry. There was a yearning within my being but we just had to adjust by the regulations of the land and the law. In the country, we would just run around, black bloomers on. It wasn't a shame to us. But in the city, there was false modesty and private property, infringements against which led to the police being called at least once. Once. 
By the 1960s, families had begun to migrate to cities in significant numbers, and housing was the stimulus. The Department of Māori Affairs Housing Scheme, which existed in various forms from 1935 to 1967, provided Māori with a plausible pathway to home ownership through low-interest loans. Matthew Rout, the University of Canterbury Research Fellow, says the programme represented a high-tide mark for government investment in housing for Māori. Māori moved into the cities when the state was at its most supportive and beneficent, he says, and was providing housing and employment. Fiona Cram, of research group Katoa Limited, says that racism was embedded in the housing programme through pepper-potting, a strategy which meant dispersing Māori into streets of Pākehā families. The government decided that Māori could have access to home loans through the Māori Affairs programmes and potentially capitalise their child's benefit, she says. But they had to go and buy a house in a good white neighbourhood so that that white neighbourhood would have a good influence on them. Aroha Harris, too, resists a tendency to view the housing scheme through rose-tinted glasses. You still needed a decent income to be able to service your mortgage, she says. That generation of people who bought homes dealt with double-digit interest rates. It's not exactly the nirvana people think it was. Even when Fano did manage to buy a house in the city, the reliance on government for work was a ceiling of another kind. They were at the bottom level in terms of income, Harris says, meaning there was no intergenerational wealth developing. Such was the case for the Fanga clan. The sisters don't remember the exact terms of the purchase, but eventually their parents owned the house at 5 Logie Street. At the dawn of the 1970s, housing and employment were quickly becoming welfare obligations rather than democratic principles. But the government's initial investment in housing had a long tail. While home ownership rates among Māori fluctuated, there was still the occasional increase as recently as the 1980s. Harris says the situation was unsustainable as the social reforms of the early 1990s would later expose. Everyone was plugged into the welfare state, she says. And we know how that goes. It all slowly gets wound back over time. Whatever its intentions, the Māori Affairs housing scheme didn't prevent a decline in Māori home ownership. In 1936, roughly 70% of Māori either owned their home or lived in a house that was owned by Māori. By 1986, only 49% of Māori owned the house they lived in. At that time, the rate for the general population was about 73%. Rout says urbanisation was one of a cascading array of reasons for that chronic decline. The others were institutional racism, and the inability to accumulate intergenerational wealth. But urbanisation was the context change, which left Māori poised for disaster. Māori have moved into the cities. They're working predominantly for the public sector, Rout says. They're in this really precarious position, where they're dependent on the state for their income and housing. That left them at the ravages and vicissitudes of the global market. And this is the outcome that we see now. Terrible poverty and poor housing outcomes. The economic reforms of the 1980s changed the labour workforce for Māori, with thousands losing their jobs and incomes. Many could no longer afford to pay off their mortgages or buy new homes. As is the case for home ownership more generally, the mother of all budgets drops onto any graph charting Māori home ownership like a lead weight. In 1991, 
the government introduced market rates to rentals and the accommodation supplement, moves credited by some with setting the course for today's housing crisis. It was the year Māori home ownership rates started to drop, Rout says. And they never rose again. They just kept trending down. At 67, May Fanga isn't the Tuakana anymore. In fact, she's become the Portiki, or last born child. 94 is the oldest, she says, listing the ages of her neighbours, and then another one around the back, 74 years old. I got invited over for a cup of tea the other day. May moved into the one bedroom house four months ago part of a small block of council housing flats in the lower hut suburb of Avalon. The house might sit on a slight lean, but within its walls, May's feet feel firmly planted. It's my own space, she says. I can yell and scream and all that. I'm really grateful. She sits down in her favourite chair, surrounded by family photos, and unfurls a colourful patchwork quilt. The blanket took around two years to complete. She closed the final stitch last year. The time span of that ambitious knitting project mirrors the time May lived at 27 Russell Road with her sister. She stayed on after Ranga's tangi to give emotional and financial support. The sleepout became May's bedroom and workspace during those two years. Frances continued to sleep in the bedroom she once shared with her husband, even while her grief seemed to engulf the house. Ask May to describe her youngest sister, and she doesn't hesitate. Frances's eyes, she says, are like a window looking directly onto her wairua, or spirit. We grew to understand and love one another even deeper, May says. I really believe that. May's housing journey before then is like a train voyage through deep fog. For at least a decade, she couch surfed at her daughter's house. She never considered herself to be homeless. She was surrounded by whānau, after all. I was just so grateful that I had a place, she says, and a place with my children. May had lived in Nainai for many years, in social housing with her first husband, where they raised their children. Then, in the late 1980s, after her father moved back to Mahia, May and her second husband bought the house at 5 Logie Street. The details of that transaction are vague, but it seems that, after separating from her second husband, May struggled to keep up with mortgage payments and eventually lost the house. May places that event sometime in the early 2000s, and while she offered the house to Fano, there was reluctance and inability to take on the cost. The house is recorded as being sold for $125,700 in 2005. May says she split the money amongst her children. The capital valuation of 5 Logie Street today is $735,000. May is philosophical about that time in her life. I sold it because I couldn't keep up, she says. But sometimes you have to let go to move on. That's the same with my sister. The house in Wainui Amata, 27 Russell Road. She had to let go because there's too many memories. Even before May moved in with Frances, she was on a council housing waiting list through Urban Plus, a social housing provider owned by Hutt City Council. Then, in late 2020, the landlord at 27 Russell Road told Frances he planned to renovate the house and afterwards increase the rent, placing a house that was already a financial burden definitively out of reach. At about that time, While both sisters were making arrangements to stay with family, May found a house through Urban Plus, 
So she moved to Lower Hutt and, for the first time in her life, has been living without Fano. It can be quite lonely, she says. Koro Nui Marae has always been a safe haven for Charmaine McLean Fanga. It's more than a venue for Tangihanga, though it's often been that too. It was through the Kohangareo on its grounds that Charmaine learned the Māori language. Then, when she retrained as a social worker in her 50s, the Marae was where she found a job. Now, at 66, it's where she still comes into work each morning. I fit in with the marae, and the marae fits in with me, she says. It's like a home away from home. The marae is also a literal housing provider. Since 2017, it's been part of the government's emergency housing programme, providing 10 rooms across two houses for single wahine or wahine with children. That's Charmaine's job supporting those women during the transition into emergency housing, then working with them to find something more permanent. In late 2020, when the landlord at 27 Russell Road signalled his intent to raise the rent, Charmaine had a conversation with her youngest sister. I had to take off my sister hat and put on my social worker hat, she says. She told Francis, You need to move out, sis. You can't afford it. Charmaine offered up Kota Nui Marae as a possible solution. Soon after, Francis moved in. The provision of housing through the Marae is nothing new, Charmaine says. The Marae has always been open to anyone who needs it. As early as the late 1970s, the Marae owned the two emergency houses keeping them for Fano, who needed somewhere to stay. And today, when Charmaine supports women who need emergency housing, she speaks from experience. Koro Nui Marae was where she herself came eight years ago. My father always said, you've got to make sure your four walls are okay before you go out and try to help other people, she recalls. Well, things weren't going very well with my husband and I. The light bulb came on, as it does. I'm getting too old for this. I decided to leave. The couple had scrimped and saved to pay off a mortgage on a house in Stokes Valley. When Charmaine left her husband, though, she became homeless. Koro Nui Marae took her in. She moved into its emergency house in Lower Hutt, where she still lives today a place she refers to as a safe haven, just like the Marae. It rebirthed me as a woman, she says. In the early 1990s, Charmaine left Stokes Valley to live with her father, who, years earlier, had relocated back to Mahia. She wanted to learn her whakapapa and get to know her father's side of the family. She would live in Mahia for 10 years, It took at least five before the community accepted her. It's the same as a marae, if you look at it, she says. You don't just go somewhere and expect someone to accept you, even though you're family. It's all a work in progress. A few months ago, Charmaine's estranged husband died, leaving her their house. They'd not spoken since the separation, but... At the request of her children, she came to the hospital. It was a time for everybody to forgive, she says, and enjoy every day of each other's company with Aroha. In June, Frances went back to work. A few days a week, she performs cervical smears at Mana Wahine, a women's health clinic based in Lower Hutt. She traces the impetus for that return to a breakthrough in counselling. It was during those sessions that Frances realised she was angry with herself, with the people around her, but also with her late husband. That anger was like an anchor, her psychologist told her. 
dragging her down wherever she went. Then, during one session, she was asked to name some of the beautiful things Ranga did for her. I remember he used to pick lavender from the bushes outside our house and leave them on the table for me, Francis says. All I could think of were the sad things, through the grieving. But then the other beautiful things came back to me, all the good memories, and that took away the sadness and the anger. On her second day back at work, the Mana Wahine Initiative celebrated its 30th anniversary, with a gathering held at Kotanui Marae. Francis listened intently to Komatua that day, some of whom had been with the clinic since its inception, and how they spoke about overcoming adversity. It was really healing for me, she says, to hear the history of how they struggled to get from there to where they are now. May was in attendance too, and thought she recognised her sister. She looked like herself again, for the first time in years. Charmaine, who was helping to manage the event, went a step further. Sister, she said, your wairua is radiant today. The sisters each have plans for the future. May hopes to move into a bigger, more modern flat in her new neighbourhood, Avalon. Charmaine is considering selling the house she owned with her husband and using the money to buy a plot of land in Mahia. The routine of going back to work over the last few months has helped Frances normalise her new surroundings, if not exactly accept them. She doesn't want to stay in emergency housing long term and knows what a house will mean to her. Happiness. I'm happy with myself, she says. I was happy to go back to work. Someday soon, I'll be happy to get my own place. Francis still wears the kōrawai at whānau gatherings and other special occasions. Tying its neck each time, she thinks of ranga, She knows he would want her to keep going. And wherever she goes next, on either side, will be her sisters. That was the Fanga Sisters on The Long Read From Stuff, written by Ethan Teora, and read by me, Michael Wright. This episode was mixed by Sam Scannell and produced by me. Stuff's podcast director is Adam Dudding. If you listened via our website, you can hear this story and more like it on the Long Read podcast, available on all the usual platforms. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening.